Wolfenstein. When said, will undoubtedly conjure thoughts of fast-paced action-packed Nazi slaying, high-octane brutal violence with a hint of the occult and cybernetic creatures. But it wasn't always quite like that. Before there was this, there was this. To understand Wolfenstein and what it's become today, we need to take a step back and investigate its humble beginnings. Let's take a look at the beginning and endpoints of this massively innovative and groundbreaking series, while delving into everything in between. It's 1981, and Celias Warner of Muse Software, the original creator of Wolfenstein, has been inspired to create a stealth action game for the Apple II, after he saw the game Berserk being played in an arcade, and then shortly after watching the movie Guns of Navarone. The seed was then planted for future generations to come along, and create some of the most influential games the world has ever seen. Castle Wolfenstein's plot is fairly simple, as was common practice for games of the time. An allied spy has been captured by the SS and taken to Castle Wolfenstein for interrogation. He manages to get his hands on a fully loaded Mauser C96 pistol, and proceeds to lay waste to any Nazi who would dare get in his way. If you're talking about Wolfenstein and innovation, it's not far-fetched for your mind to head towards Wolfenstein 3D with how it revolutionised the first-person shooter genre, but Wolfenstein's innovation also lies within its roots with Castle Wolfenstein being one of the very first games to utilise stealth mechanics, while also being one of the first, if not the first, game to include digitised voices. When it comes to the gameplay, it's not as simple as one might have thought based on when this game came out and its simplistic graphics, with you clearing your way through 60 different rooms by either impersonating guards, killing or taking guards hostage, and looting corpses and chests. The two enemy types in this game also help to spice things up, with the basic guards not being too much of a threat and easily dispatched, to the SS Stormtroopers, who will more than likely notice your disguise, chase you from room to room, and not go down without a fight. The game was followed up with a sequel, Beyond Castle Wolfenstein in 1984, where the player attempts to sneak through a secret Nazi bunker with a concealed bomb in a briefcase with the objective of killing Hitler. The games from the early 80s, while being rather rudimentary in terms of what games would go on to become, still managed to pick up quite the cult following, and left an impression on two rather important minds in the game industry. Unfortunately, Celias would pass away in 2004 from kidney disease. Celias, as described by his wife, a marvellous giant, creative genius with an amazing sense of humour, who led the bravest and fullest life possible. Yeah! It's 1991, and a group of developers going by the name Ideas From The Deep, consisting of John Romero, John Carmack, Adrian Carmack and Tom Hall, are reaching the end of their contractual obligations for the company Softdisk, where they had developed games such as the beloved Commander Keen series, Dangerous Dave in the Haunted Mansion, and early attempts at first-person styled games, Hover Tank 3D and Catacomb 3D. Now formally established as id Software, they had their sights set on creating a new game. A few ideas were thrown around, until ultimately John Romero suggested a 3D remake of 1981's Castle Wolfenstein, which the team agreed to, as both John Romero and John Carmack had quite the impression left on them from the original games. When deciding what game to make, how did you decide on bringing back Wolfenstein? The idea just appeared to me, due to the restrictions we already had. We had a 3D engine that could draw mazes with 90 degree walls, and Castle Wolfenstein could be rendered faithfully with it. The game's scope was already known since the game was a popular classic, and the design was not too big to attempt. No other games back then had you blasting Nazis during World War II, so it would also be innovative. After contacting Celias Warner, the team at Eid learnt that Mew Software, the original owners of the Wolfenstein IP, went broke in 1987, leaving the Wolfenstein name to be picked up by a broker. After tracking down who then owned the rights, they were able to purchase them for only $5,000. How did Eid go about acquiring the rights? Did you guys have to hunt for the owner yourselves? We finally hired Jay Wilbur as a CEO in 1992, so he could focus on figuring out how to get the rights. He tracked down the sale of assets of Muse to a woman in Baltimore. He contacted her and bought the rights for $5,000. 
After the rights were acquired, the focus shifted towards creating their vision of a Wolfenstein game. With John Carmack tweaking the game engine to provide a smoother playing experience than their previous FPS games, while John Romero and Tom Hall started to design the game using Carmack's engine. What was the process behind designing the levels? Actually, making the Wolf 3D levels was the most boring process I've ever experienced in game dev. They're just a 2D matrix of blocks with placement of enemies, treasure, items, pathing objects, etc. There was very little creativity available because of the restriction of the game's engine representation of 90 degree walls. So Tom and I really slogged through making all 60 levels. We had to encourage each other to keep on pushing on with it because it was so boring. It was way more fun to play Fatal Fury on the Neo Geo. It was right next to us. We made the levels in my tool TED5, which we had just used for all the Commander Keen games and all the other games we made in 1991. I didn't need to modify TED5 for Wolf 3D, we just made the stuff it needed, icons and tiles for backgrounds and object layers. Making a level wasn't hard, we could do a level a day, so both of us could make all 60 in 30 work days. <laughs> William B.J. Blaskowitz was now born. With this being a different era of video games, in between each mission would be a little splice of exposition, and it decided B.J., an American spy of Polish descent, would be this game's titular badass protagonist. Little did they know, they were creating one of, if not, the world's most important and influential game ever. The multi-billion dollar industry world of FPS games we all know and love today was shaped in one way or another by this very game. The Wolfenstein series has been influential in multiple ways, with Solias adding digitized speech to the 1981 game, which was the first, or one of the first instances of it being in a game, and then you guys creating the game that would kickstart the whole FPS genre. What was it like being a part of something so special? Solias used code from The Voice, a speech synthesis program he wrote and marketed by Muse, to play the Nazi speech in the Apple II version. We knew that putting guns into the player's hands was going to be a big win for the first person viewpoint, because our other attempts didn't work, Hover Tank 1 with the tank turret like Battlezone, and Catacomb 3D with a wizard's hand shooting fireballs. Both of those attempts were weak. Guns in your hand was the winner. We didn't think about it being the start of a genre, we were just trying to make a fun game. So many games back then were the first of their kind, so our different game was just another game for us. Upon completion of the shareware version of the game, the guys at id got to personally show Solias what they had done with the Wolfenstein IP. From an interview John Romero had with Polygon, he says, We drove from Dallas with our brand new Toshiba Color laptop in hand, with the newly finished Wolfenstein 3D shareware on it. We listened to Solias give a talk about Muse and the great stuff he programmed. After his talk, we got to show him Wolfenstein 3D, and he loved it. We had him sign a manual of the game, which is displayed in id's offices. We stayed up for hours at night in the college dorm hallway, talking with him about Muse, the Apple II, and everything we could hope to hear him talk about. It was a great day. As for the gameplay, Wolfenstein 3D was quite unlike anything of the time, which was intentional, as John Romero said he wanted it to be a loud and cool action game, where he felt it should be fast and simple. Due to the novelty of a 3D game and control scheme, players would not be receptive to more complicated slow gameplay. How come you decided on making it fast paced? The new 3D engine was capable of rendering scenes at 70 FPS, and no other game had done that back then. Games were mostly static screens, they rarely even scrolled, and if they did they were 2D. There were almost no 3D games of the time. The ones that were 3D were not texture mapped. Star Glider, Archipelago, etc. The only other texture mapped game was Ultima Underworld, released just weeks before Wolf 3D. It had a slow refresh rate because it was doing a lot more calculations for looking up and down, and the gameplay was not fast paced as designed. Being a super fast 70 FPS game would make Wolfenstein 3D stand out and show what the PC could do. And this would prove to be the right decision, with Wolfenstein 3D being widely regarded as the game that helped popularise the first person shooter genre, while establishing the standard for fast paced action, which would prove to be a stepping stone for its future games like Doom and Quake, and not to mention every other FPS game released in the 90s, as they'd all be labelled either Wolfenstein or Doom clones in one way or another. Its vast, labyrinthine starred level structure, with hidden keys the player has to find to progress, would also be another gameplay feature widely adopted by subsequent FPS games, proving as a way to intentionally engage the player's mind so they're not just running and gunning straight towards the finish line. 
that mindset would prove to be rather difficult in a handful of Wolfenstein's levels, with the structural layout of the castle seemingly following no logical sense at all, which is perhaps why it lends itself so well to the idea of secret hunting. The immensely large and confusing to navigate castle is full of hidden nooks and crannies scattered all over the place that only the most dedicated treasure hunters would be able to uncover. What went into deciding where to put the secrets? We originally couldn't put secrets into the game because the push walls weren't put in. John didn't want to violate the purity of his engine with a nasty hack for secret walls, but we finally convinced him we needed it. He put it in and Tom and I had to go back over all of the maps and redesign them for secret areas, because if we wanted a secret in the centre of the map, we had to change rooms around and maybe even the flow of a level. It wasn't a hard process, it just took time. Wolfenstein 3D would also receive some other level packs in the forms of Nocturnal Missions and Spear of Destiny, serving as prequels to the original game, where BJ Blazkowicz embarks on more Nazi-killing adventures. I asked John Romero about a few things I'd read about the game online. I've read on Wikipedia that the game was going to feature some anti-fascist references and Nazi atrocities, but left them out to avoid controversies. Do you remember any of them? No, we weren't going to do that. The only thing I thought about doing was having the Nazis who were near death kneel on the ground and beg you not to kill them. We decided that was probably crossing the line of bad taste, so we left it out. What's your opinion on Wolf 3D being the reason that all subsequent games with Nazi imagery either had to be edited or not released at all in Germany, and your opinion on it finally being unbanned in Germany last year? Actually, Nazi imagery was banned in Germany after World War II, so it follows that games with Nazi imagery would likewise be banned. I think it's good that it's been unbanned so more people can see what the fuss was all about. After speaking to John Romero about his part in creating Wolfenstein 3D, I had a chat with someone who got to experience the game firsthand with it being their very first FPS game, so they could talk to me about their experience with it and what the game means to them. Do you remember what it was like seeing Wolfenstein 3D for the first time, and playing a game where you controlled it from the perspective of your character? I remember it being kind of like revolutionary in a way. Like I, I was saying that the first kind of proper first person game I played was like a, a tank combat, like a tank sim game. but seeing it from like the perspective of another person for the first time was just mental but there was more than that it was kind of like the fact that it kind of looked like distinguishable like figures with like the nazis and the weapons and the levels and stuff it was um it was like a comic book come to life dude so yeah it was a pretty it was a pretty game-changing life-changing experience for sure do you think the game has had much of an impact on you like has it affected what sort of games you're into nowadays yeah, I mean, I think without playing Wolfenstein 3D, like I wouldn't have been into like first person shooters because obviously Doom came out after that. And Doom was the game that I think got a lot of people hooked on like shooters for life. And I did for me, but that was, yeah, that was definitely like the the, the turning point where you could look at it and see the potential that it kind of had as a genre. I mean, if you think about like other games at the time that were first person, like nothing was really like the way that Wolfenstein 3D was with like graphic violence and sound effects and music, like it was, you could see like where they could be taking it from that point. Do you remember any of your fondest memories involving the game? One memory that like always stuck in my mind the most was at the end of the first episode and probably this mostly because like I played the shareware version so much before I owned the full version but yeah like the last level of the first episode when you open that door and like Hans Gross is standing there with like dual chain guns and you've never like fought an enemy that is that tough before? So you've got the chain gun and you shoot him and you think he's going to die, but then you realize that like this dude's like next level. So that was definitely like, yeah, that, that was always a memory that lingers in my head is just open that door and seeing that big dude standing there. And then a the bit after that, when you like escape the castle and it's got like that animation of him like running and jumping. Yeah, it's very, um, it always sticks in my mind when I think about that game. Is it one of those games you revisit often? Yes and no. I mean, there's definitely like a nostalgia factor to it, but I don't think it's really aged that well in terms of just going back into it and playing it again. Like you can go back and play like Doom and Quake and stuff. And, and there's kind of like a, a general like remembrance of the layouts of levels and that kind of stuff. But Wolfenstein 3D, I feel is 
very maze-like. It's kind of the same thing with like Rise of the Triad where even if you've played those levels heaps of times, you'll eventually just get to the point where you feel like you're going around in circles again. So I think it's um I think it's on that cusp of where shooters became replayable. That's why I think I would have easily played Doom more than Wolfenstein. So it, it's, yeah, it's more of a nostalgia thing, but in terms of just like, oh, I'm going to play this game again, like it's, I don't think it really rates in that kind of category for me. Do you think the gameplay is accessible to modern audiences? Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't say it is. And I think it's just like, because a lot of the factors in how that game plays don't apply to other shooters that have aged. Like, you know, you've got all these recent boomer shooters like Dusk and a Middle Evil, a Medieval and stuff like that, which are like your Heretics and your, your Hexens and, and Quake and stuff kind of carried across into more modern games. But Wolfenstein 3D, I felt, was a little bit different in, in terms of that. Like the gameplay was just about kind of seeing an enemy and shooting them before they shot you and hoping that they don't shoot you in the back, which is more often than not how you would die in that game. So that style of gameplay, I think, has, has uh, time hasn't been too kind to it, I would say. What's your opinion on Nocturnal Missions and Spear of Destiny? Um, I think Spear of Destiny is pretty good because, I, I mean, I think from memory, that's like the only official one. Um, and that had some pretty cool levels in it. I think the new music and the new little additions, like um, I remember they had boxes of ammo and then the whole thing at the end where you like went to hell from memory, right? And then you were like fighting the Angel of Death or something really messed up like that. It's kind of awesome because I think that's like the first time that the game start, the series started to shift into that paranormal element, which is kind of what they've you know kept to all those modern reboots and that. Um, Nocturnal missions, if that's what I'm thinking of, if that's the original game, yeah, I think they were pretty good. The only ones I don't like are the ones that came out after Spirit Destiny. There's like some unofficial, well, not unofficial, but just mission packs made by people that weren't its software, which from memory, which is absolutely terrible. Do you still play it in its original form, or do you prefer to use something like a source port with an auto map? Yeah, I, I can't remember the version I played last, but yeah, I'm definitely a source port guy now. Only because like it just objectively makes it more enjoyable to play, um, and you can play it at like a widescreen resolution. And I think there's even one yeah, like you said, where it adds in an auto map, but it also adds in like being able to play with the WASD keys as well as the mouse. So you can almost play it like you're playing Doom. Like obviously you can't aim up and down, but just to be able to play it and strafe left and strafe right, uh, it plays so much smoother, man.